Hello, Rich from PC Games N here, and I've been playing Total War Warhammer 2. Here's our video review. To begin with faction designs, always the star of the show, as you might expect if you've looked at the direction of travel of Creative Assembly's DLC races for the original game, Total War Warhammer 2 launches with four distinct factions which reflect Warhammer lore in unique, innovative gameplay mechanics. To begin with the Dark Elves, their economy is based on slavery, but slaves will die out over time, meaning that you have to keep replenishing them by raiding and pillaging. So far, so Dark Elves, but there's a catch. Too many slaves in a province and public order will start to suffer. Moreover, you don't get public order management buildings until Settlement Tier 2, and you can't turn off taxation. So you have fewer tools to control your slaves until you develop your cities, but if you let them die off, you'll struggle to keep your armies in the field. You're forced, then, to keep raging and pillaging like a Dark Elf should, but you need to plan your conquests to avoid public order problems. It's a tricky balancing act to strike and a thematic challenge for the Dark Elves. Skaven are similarly nudged to expand thanks to their unique food mechanic, which contains a carrot and a stick to make you keep expanding, raiding, pillaging, and topping up your stocks. The stick is that your armies will consume food every turn, but the carrot is that you can spend food to colonize settlements at up to building tier 3, enabling you to expand like the verminous tide that you are. Lizardmen, by contrast, are the game's turtlers and builders. Their geomantic web mechanic means that upgrading your cities grants stronger versions of some very powerful provincial commandments. For example, at tier 5, the alignment of war adds plus 15% weapon strength and plus 10 leadership for local armies. It also adds plus 2 unit experience and minus 30% recruitment cost for local unit recruits. As if that weren't enough, it adds plus 1 global recruitment capacity faction-wide. That's huge and makes the Lizardmen the masters of territorial defence as well as giving you a great incentive to develop your cities. High Elves are the most conventional faction, which is no bad thing, I guess, if you like how Total War traditionally plays. As another incentive to play with each of the sequel's four races, Total War Warhammer 2 is also the first in the franchise to try to tell a real story. The Great Vortex at the heart of Bulthuan is unstable, and all races are trying to influence it for their own ends. Why it's unstable, what those ends are, and the characters involved in all of this, these are the elements of a real plot. And that plot even has a genuine twist towards the endgame. All four factions will try to influence the Vortex through a series of five rituals. When you complete any ritual, you'll get a cutscene made of lavish artwork and great voiceovers. You can review them through a new option in the main menu, and unlocking them all is another incentive to complete the game with every race. Thanks to Creative Assembly hiring former Games Workshop writer Andy Hall, these cutscenes are treated with an expert's understanding of the Warhammer Fantasy universe. It may have been founded on Tolkien-esque fantasy tropes, but after 25 years of grimdark injections, it's got its own identity now, and CA have treated it with proper reverence. A brief note of praise for the voice acting as well. Malekith in particular sounds like a proper badass, and Teclis sounds as frail and wimpy as he should. But Total War has not become StarCraft, this is still a sandbox campaign rather than a sequential one, and ultimately the Vortex story really only serves as a wrapper for the new Vortex victory condition. Creative Assembly have said that this is their attempt to address a common strategy game complaint, the boring, busy work-filled cruise to victory at the endgame. My biggest problem with this, really, are the artificial challenges that the game throws at you when you're attempting the rituals. By Rituals 4 and 5, you can expect at least five full stacks of Chaos Warriors to just appear in your territory, generally near your most vulnerable cities. As an experiment, I reloaded a few autosaves and moved my troops around to see if I could defend myself better, and the stacks appear to spawn wherever your own troops are not. I have to say, it wasn't much fun, watching these stacks run rampantly around my heartlands, tearing the guts out of my economy with my nearest army several turns march away, especially when I thought I'd done the prudent thing by covering my ritual cities well. I can guess at what CA were going for here, the tension of knowing that no city is ever truly safe, the rubber band-like mechanism to keep you from pulling too far ahead, the sense of escalation as you approach the endgame, and to be fair, this may be a matter of taste. If all of that sounds appealing to you, then great. Personally though, I like curating and planning an efficient empire, and right now it feels as though you can't attempt a late game vortex ritual without the basically guaranteed loss of a couple of cities, which isn't a great feeling. It certainly fits within the Warhammer universe, though. So let's talk about the setting for all of this. Total War Warhammer 2's map may be only slightly larger than the originals by settlement count, but it feels much more epic, thanks to the fact that it's got a bloody great ocean in the middle and four different continents. 
Warhammer 2 is a global conflict as opposed to a continental one, and yet it's still packed with lots of lovely visual details. In a game-changing quality of life improvement, you can also control which AI factions the end turn camera will follow, but I often found myself just sitting back and watching the camera fly around, just enjoying the view. And finally, I want to talk about a couple of granular but still impactful changes to gameplay on the campaign map, which show just the extent of the attention to detail that Creative Assembly have lavished on this game. These tweaks are most obvious in the post-battle options, which have all been adjusted to make them equally tempting. Ransoming captives is less appealing now since it incurs a penalty to your army's replenishment rate, while executing captives now gives unit experience rather than just leadership, although the Lizardmen do get both. Elsewhere, you can no longer retreat if you're attacked in march stance, which makes it much more precarious. So these small changes make the game's most commonplace activities, travel and combat, pose much more interesting questions than they did first time around. And that's how the whole game feels, really. Creative Assembly could have phoned it in, we know that all three Warhammer games will have to be intercompatible, so had they just released a new map and four new factions, they had their excuses ready-made. But they've done a lot more than that, not only adding a new story and a new victory type that partially succeeds in fixing a consistent issue with Total War games, but also looking at the Total War formula at every level and looking for new ways to squeeze value out of it. It still devolves into Notification Dismissal Simulator at the end of the campaign, but that's nothing new for Grand Strategy. There are also some technical hitches, particularly when it comes to quests not lining up with in-game events properly. In closing, it's also worth acknowledging that this game will get a truckload of both paid and also free downloadable content. Your personal standard of DLC tolerance may differ from mine, but I can say that the base game by itself offers plenty of replay value. I've got nearly 40 hours clocked so far and I'm nowhere near finished. On a trip to the studio about 10 months ago, Creative Assembly told us that the success of the original Total War Warhammer had caused them to reevaluate their ambitions for the rest of the series, and this game does feel like a step change in that respect. This is a rich and thoughtful strategy game that's a joy to engage with at practically every level, and represents a new height of ambition for Creative Assembly. And that's about it. That's what I thought of Total War Warhammer 2. Thanks very much for watching. I really hope you found that helpful. If you did, give us a like, share, subscribe, ring the bell to keep up with notifications from my channel. There's plenty more PC gaming content on PC games in YouTube and on our website. Until then, thanks very much for watching and take care.